So today, this is what we're going to discuss, the question of Indian ethics and values. Um, I'm not going to speak much actually on the Gita. I'm taking this uh, backdrop because uh, first of all, it's a beautiful painting. Number two, of course, yes, it will raise one of the important question of ethics that uh, he has asked. But, uh, before we start, the, why do we speak of ethics so much nowadays? There is no exact word for ethics in ancient India. There is, of course, the concept of dharma, uh, which is sometimes translated as ethics, but it's much broader than this. There is niti, but niti again is not fully ethics. It is also the law, it is the rule, it is governance, it is... So the, the Indian terms and the Western terms never perfectly match. But, um, but yes, discussions about dharma, and we will see some of them have been central uh, to Indian thought. Uh, that is to say, how, how should individual lives be ruled? How should the collectivity a society be ruled by what guidelines, more than laws. In fact, the concept of law in ancient India is very fluid. Uh, uh, people say, for example, that uh, Manushmriti is a book of law. It is not a book of law. It is a book of guidelines. What, how should the society behave? Uh, even Arthashastra is not very much about uh, law-making. There are uh, things like that, but it is more about uh, what should guide, what are the notions that should guide the society. So we're going to discuss this and of course ethics is largely about ultimately, the, the, the ultimate objective is to find some harmony or happiness. And uh, there have been many studies in the West, in fact I notice uh, that in the West the concept of happiness studies has been uh, 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 propagating very fast in the last few years, maybe because there is so much unhappiness around. And uh, what, what is it that makes happiness is a, a big question mark. In fact, these are statistics published by a French organization, Ipsos, a couple of years ago, <coughs> where they have been with a, a whole lot of criteria. It's not, of course, a single question put to the people, are you happy or not? It is uh, combining uh, data from a lot of different questions and uh, you find here that in blue, the blue part, because you may not be able to read, especially those at the back, uh, the blue represents the percentage of very happy people and the green rather happy people. So of course both together are a fairly good indicator. And <clears throat> the first country in the world that reports the greatest happiness is strange Indonesia. Why Indonesia? I don't know. They have so many tsunamis and uh, volcanic eruptions and uh, I, I'm not very sure why, what makes Indonesians so happy. But the second is India where 43 percent people re report being very happy and 45 uh, rather happy. So, you know, these are a little apparently paradoxical uh, data because you find at the end, if you move to the, the, the right part of the graph, you find actually very advanced nations like Japan, Germany, France, Poland, Italy, Spain, which are reporting the least uh, percentage of happy people. So this is um, perhaps uh, the more wealth or the more material development you have, perhaps the more demanding you become, I do not know. I'm not uh, expressing a conclusion. But I just wanted to put this graph in front of you because it's, it, it, excuse me? Yes, that's very true. The, the French are known for complaining all the time. But um, <clears throat> look at Italy. They're supposed, they were suppo they're, they're normally supposed to be people and they're not. And Spanish even worse. What exactly is happening, I'm not sure. Anyway, let's not go into a global discussion of happiness. But I, I wanted to show that the problem is not simple. It's not simple. Just a light-hearted comment. Both Italians and Indians are known to lie a lot. Are known to lie? Uh, just just light-hearted comment. I will perhaps disagree with you in the course of my presentation. You will see. So 
there is this old saying that money doesn't make happiness. And of course, people tend to disagree because, you know, they want certainly uh, enough wealth. But somebody called David Myers, and I'm borrowing his graph here, he has a website on studies of happiness, uh, has done this graph where you can see in um, blue the increase of personal income in the United States from something like 1958 uh, to, to almost the present times. And you can see in red the uh, measure of happiness, again measured through a lot of criteria. So clearly the two things do not appear to be correlated. And uh, this is something we can keep in mind. Now let us come to the Indian context where, you know, as always I like to start at the right beginning, so we go back to the Rigveda text we have, where towards the end of it we find this very strange pronouncement mm, with apologies for uh, poor pronunciation of Vedic Sanskrit, but Manur Bhava Janaya Daivam Janam. So this is, uh, first of all, an exhortation to become human, which implies, strangely, and of course Rig Veda does not explain anything, it just says what it has to say, that we are not yet human. This is interesting to consider, and then create the divine Janam, divine people or whatever. So this is the briefest possible compass is giving you know, a dual objective to us that uh, we must uh, cultivate our humanity but also look towards a further step which is uh, to integrate the divine element or the divine realization. Uh, now how does this translate into practical values, practical guidelines? Of course we have to turn to the Upanishads and there there are a number of pronouncements we're going to find uh, giving a kind of broad framework to, to the further developments. And uh, we will find many of them actually reflecting in certain uh, specificities of Indian civilization. The first is the well-known Vedantic pronouncement, Aham Brahma Asmi. So, uh, uh, I, I am this divinity, what uh, Rig Veda seemed to imply also. And therefore, the fact that life's purpose given to us is to grow conscious of this fact. Now there's another interesting pronouncement that all creatures are impelled by consciousness. And uh, this is important because it is going to be the root of the Indian concern for other creatures, not only humanity at large, but other creatures, animals, and we're going to see that reflected into actual practices a little later on. Even plants, trees, I had touched upon this in the uh, talk on ecological traditions of India and uh, this is actually the, the, the origin of it. And I always like to contrast this with the famous debates that uh, you had in medieval Europe. Of course, under the uh, debates um, triggered by the dogmas given by the Roman Catholic Church, uh, one of the debates, if you study uh, European philosophy, is, you know, whether, uh, two questions. First was whether animals had a soul. And uh, the answer was no. Animals have no souls. Uh, they are there to serve humanity, and uh, humanity has to, you know, absolute freedom to exploit them in whatever ways it wants. And that has certainly oriented certain actual developments in the West. The second, at the time of colonialism, when the colonial era finally took off and uh, the slave trade uh, uh, grew by leaps and bounds, was the few philosophers objected and said, you know, that uh, those black people are actually, after all, they are human uh, beings also, we should not treat them like that. So the question was put to the church, you know, whether blacks have a soul. And the initial answer again was no. Blacks do not have a soul. They are not actually human beings. So we can, again, exploit them in any way we like. So, the, you know, these uh, questions are actually, um, the, uh, sometimes the philosophical root of it all is very important to consider because it does end up making a huge difference in practice. Now, this interconnectedness of all creatures, all creation, is expressed in many ways. For example, wishing 
happiness, wellness to the to all creatures. Sarve bhavantu sukhina. Bhavantu here means all creatures, not just humans. So this is uh, something that will be, in fact, the root of the later concept of ahimsa. Uh, in these Upanishads, it doesn't come explicitly, but later on it will come, and of course it will be and Jainism, this kind of compassion for all creatures. Another very important concept which will have considerable ethical consequences in India is, you know, people say Indians are very tolerant and if we look at uh, the whole development of uh, philosophical thought, religious thought, uh, you cannot, you can always point to lots of rivalries, sometimes very bitter doctrinal attacks on, on one sector or another, but you can do, for example, wars of religion in the way in Europe had in the, in the uh, different uh, Christian churches uh, grew in, in importance, uh, grew in rivalry. The kind of bloody uh, uh, wars that you had in Europe between, for example, Catholics and Protestants, uh, never took place in India. Even if you may have very, very limited uh, physical confrontations, there are two, three cases you might quote, but basically uh, it could not grow be 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 beyond a certain point because of this concept of Swabhava and Swadharma, which is very deeply rooted in the Upanishads. And uh, that is to say the fact that we are all different from each other. So there are certain fundamental truths which are common, like of course the first one here at the top, that concerns everybody. But otherwise there is a recognition that because we have a different bhava, a different nature, we should impose a path for each of us. It looks so simple, you know, to say that in India, but please consider that the West has never had this philosophy, neither in principle nor in it's only with the, after the age of enlightenment and the growth of humanism that this principle also uh, <clears throat> spread in the West. Otherwise, it was not the case. There was one set of dogmas for everybody. Well, this could not be the case in India for this reason. It is the root of Indian pluralism, in other words. Now, the Gita, as I s said at the beginning, well, yes, it raises very important ethical questions, which I will not develop much because you, you need not one, but a whole set of lectures for that alone. So I just want to remind the important questions which are there. Uh, first of all, the fairly new concept of Nishkama Karma, uh, that is to say equality in, in success and failure. It looks, again, very easy to say it's very difficult to live. It's extremely difficult, for example, you know, not to feel good when you encounter success and not to feel bad or affected when you encounter failure. So, but this is the philosophy that uh, the Gita demands from us. And in other words, a complete freedom from attachment. So the, we, we, ha we have a duty, but we have no right to the fruits of our work. So that's not very easy to live. But this is the foundation of the notion of karma yoga in, uh, uh, in the Indian system of yogas, where we are expected to have a will to succeed without being attached to the success. It's, uh, it's actually something that I point out because it runs almost opposite to the whole philosophy that comes to us, you know, from the American schools of management of business when success is the ultimate goal and uh, uh, you have to succeed and sometimes you know at any cost by <laughs> by hook or by crook of course uh, there will be a lot of talk about uh, ethics in business and so on but success is far more it overrides everything else so we have here two very distinct approaches excellence in uh, works is what defines karma yoga, that is well known. But then this uh, very important uh, question which will be, I will very briefly touch upon it towards the end, which will be hotly debated between the freedom movement in India. Uh, because you had people who said, you know, the so-called revolutionaries whom the British called extremists, 
who were saying that it's perfectly legitimate to use force uh, to achieve independence. And uh, after all, many uh, European countries uh, had achieved independence uh, through, through force also, through revolutions. And then at the other end of it, we had, of course, Mahatma Gandhi, who said, no, we will achieve independence without the use of force or violence. So this is a very delicate uh, uh, and complex issue. And the Gita apparently tells us and tells Krishna, I mean, uh, Krishna tells Arjuna uh, you know, through a long discourse that uh, there is nothing wrong in killing and it is actually, as a Kshatriya, it is your duty to kill whether these people are your, your brothers, your cousins, uh, because you, your dharma is to, is, is, as a Kshatriya, is to defend dharma and if you do not fight and kill, uh, then dharma will not win. So you're not fighting for your own uh, selfish uh, objectives of becoming the ruler or recovering your kingdom, but for the sake of dharma. So, of course, uh, uh, there is an contra apparent contradiction. When Mahatma Gandhi was repeatedly questioned as to how he could say that uh, Gita was, you know, the text that inspired him the most, when he was apparently pre preaching the opposite, in fact, he was preaching what Arjuna preaches right at the beginning of the Gita, you know, that I don't want to fight. Uh, why should I kill all these people? There is no purpose in this. Let me give them my whole kingdom. So this is in a way, the, you might say, the Gandhian gospel, but then Krishna overturns it. So his answer was that um, uh, the Gita must be taken purely at a symbolic uh, level. It is nothing but... Uh, an image for the inner war, the inner evils we have to conquer and, yes, destroy, but it is not to be taken in a physical sense. Of course, many scholars could not agree with, the, with this. If you read the whole, I mean, the Gita as integrated in the entire Mahabharata, it doesn't seem to be uh, a very cogent explanation, but I have to leave that uh, to everyone's opinion. It's a very big debate and I do not claim to answer it here, just to put it in front of you. Now. There are many texts, so many that uh, uh, you, you, in fact, I give, uh, in one Indian Institute of Management, I give a series of 10 talks on these texts of uh, Indian ethics. And I uh, just selected a, a couple of them as illustrations. There is uh, Rama, of course, we have, for example, uh, you know, when uh, uh, Bhishma is lying on the bed of arrows, you have a very, very long discourse on the duties of a king given to uh, Yudhishthira, what uh, a king should do. So suddenly it's all about dharma and uh, how a king should follow that. So there are many such discourses in the Indian text which are obviously intended to give a, a, an ideal in front of the rulers and for them to follow. And in fact, rulers never failed to boast that they were following those models. If you see the actual historical inscriptions, you have lots of kings, probably hundreds, comparing themselves to Rama, comparing themselves to all those great uh, semi-historical or possibly even non-historical uh, uh, figures. And, uh, you know, sometimes saying that they are equal to Rama or even in a few cases that they are greater than Rama. So it's extremely difficult to know in actual practice you know, how ethical or how dharmic their rule was, but that was at least the model given to everybody, and there was a, a, at the very least a desire to emulate. So here we, you know, when, uh, you remember the story when uh, uh, Bharata comes and rejoins Rama, Lakshmana, and Sita, who have already left uh, towards the exile, and he comes to uh, inform Rama that they are father has uh, died, in fact, and that therefore he wants him to come back to Ayodhya. And then, of course, Rama is going to refuse uh, because he has given his promise and so on and so forth. So you know the story. But then he, even before Bharata can open his mouth and uh, uh, start conveying the news, the first thing that Rama says is this. I trust that you do not sleep too much, you know, as, as the king now that you wake at the appropriate time. So he's spelling out the fundamental functions, duties of the king. And spend the early hours of the morning thinking about how you can achieve your ends. <clears throat> Do not take advice from only one man. This is about advisors to the ruler. That's always a very big topic in 
how should a ruler select his advisors, how many, to what extent, etc. Not, no, either from make sure that your innermost thoughts are not spread all over the kingdom. So keep your cards to yourself. You know, these are very advice. Choose one learned and intelligent man as your advisor <laughs> instead of a thousand foolish men. Um, give the best of your retainers the most important tasks to perform. This is extremely important. It's the fact that a, a ruler cannot be expected to tackle all the tasks of governance. It's not possible. It was not possible then, so it would be even much less possible now. And therefore, delegate, delegate. So this is what he says. Honor and praise your army appropriately. Keep your army in good humor and well, you know, satisfied. Uh, this is obviously, for very obvious reasons, quite important. Reassure the women and make sure that they are safe. And the safety of women was already a concern, obviously. Keep your income greater than your expenditure, so no credit cards uh, in uh, ancient times. But uh, the notion of credit uh, did exist. I mean, you could be in debt, deeply in debt. So that was uh, regarded as uh, not dharmic, in fact. And justice, the tears of an innocent man unjustly accused can destroy the progeny of a king. <clears throat> and there are many, many stories to illustrate this concept. In South India, we have, for example, this uh, epic, the Shilapadikaram, you know, the story of Karnagi and uh, Kovalan. And it's all about, at the end, about a king who has unjustly... And actually, the king was not even responsible, but the king's men unjustly accused and killed uh, Karnagi's uh, husband. Uh, do not pursue power, finally. Do not pursue power at the cost of dharma. Hmm? So, this, I think, is a still very highly relevant, uh, of course, piece of advice. Now, in the epics, I could go on and on quoting such uh, uh, good advice, but then there, is, there are always these exceptions to the rules. And those big discussions in, in the epics in particular, also in the Puranas and so on, about exactly where is dharma, where does it end, you know, what are the... the, the so you have so many special situations which are discussed, for example, and which obviously you can see that the writers, whoever they may be, or whoever, or people hiding behind those names, doesn't matter, whoever composed those epics very deliberately provoked those situations. They might have avoided them altogether, but they bring them up to actually... Uh, and remember also, incidentally, that those epics are not texts that were read initially. They were texts which were told, you know, uh, the uh, tradition, for example. So you had people who were going from village to village, often paid by the king. The, we have inscriptions from that. And uh, who would, you know, tell the assembled villages <coughs> those stories. So uh, you can also say that those special situations are also, uh, you know, deliberate provocation to keep the listeners uh, awake in the course of the long night when the story is going to be told. So we have many special cases. Of course, for example, the slave of Drona. And you know, remember, I'm not going to repeat the story. Uh, you remember how he was uh, uh, unfairly killed because he could not be killed. He was uh, so gifted with the handling of weapons that he could not be killed through any there was no one good enough to do that. So therefore, Krishna manipulated circumstances in a way that you know to get him. And then this big question comes, you know, was it right to do that? Was it dharmic? After all these talks about dharma, can you utter a lie? And you know that Yudhishthira's chariot was supposed to be always a little above ground level before that and then after he uttered his lie, he touched ground. So, but then, then uh, the answer was by telling an untruth for saving a life, one is not touched by sin, because as long as he was alive, he was slaughtering uh, the, the Pandavas' uh, armies at a fast rate. Now, this could be, of course, debatable. There are other situations, uh, such as the killing of Karna. And Karna, again, is killed at a moment where he's defenseless. And this is against all the Kshatriya codes. 
that were promo promoted in those days. And um, then, of course, the, the author keeps Karna alive for a sufficient length of time so that he can give uh, Arjuna a long speech where he, you know, blames Arjuna and Krishna for having used uh, uh, undharmic, uh, adharmic uh, manners. And uh, then the answer that um, Krishna gives in the end, that of course is something that can be debated, no, not everybody would agree, is that you cannot expect to be treated in a dharmic way if you do not practice dharma yourself. And they, then of course they quote to Karna all the uh, uh, in which, you know, in his support of uh, Duryodhana, uh, he actually uh, failed to defend dharma. So, this is uh, something that one may or may not agree with. And we have a parallel case in the Ramayana, where Rama kills Vali, the king of monkeys, uh, who had um, uh, usurped Sugriva's throne and wife and again in totally unfair uh, means. So um, then again there is a whole discourse that uh, dying Vali gives, uh, you know, saying, Rama, you, you have come here to, uh, supposedly to defend dharma and recover your wife, but look what was you've done. And this is portrayed in many, uh, many temples, in fact, in India. Tell the story, this is from Karnataka, tell the story of the Ramayana or the main episodes and you can see here though Valmiki's Ramayana does not give those details but he, Rama is hiding behind a tree here and shooting an arrow through Vali here. So, so these are uh, deliberate situations which are <coughs> whatever the answers are given whether we may agree or disagree with the answers and a lot of uh, you know very modern scholars uh, go back to those stories to uh, uh, to actually um, judge these episodes often by the, uh, the by the light of <coughs> very modern concepts which is in my way not a very good method but anyway that's what they do and um, uh, we have of course these questions deliberately put to at least get people to think about them <coughs> there are many other systems of ethics. Uh, Jainism has its own ethics, but it is very close to that of Buddhism, barring one or two specialties. So I'm not going to spend much time on, on, on this. It's very similar to what you find in the uh, Puranas, Upanishads before that. But it has its own which is about a dharmic vision, intention or aspiration, especially to achieve uh, freedom, uh, speech, uh, especially speech that should be always truthful and that does not hurt others, right action that specifically includes ahimsa, and of course ahimsa becomes all important in Buddhism and Jainism as you know, right livelihood, so you should uh, not earn through dishonest ways. And then the last ones are more difficult, right? Effort to purify the mind, right? Mindfulness, that is to say alertness, constant self-observation in particular. Right concentration. So these are which uh, Buddhism uh, insists upon, and these are for the laity. They are, they are not, uh, the monks uh, have these plus many others in addition. So, of course, we can see that um, if uh, an individual or a collectivity were to follow these uh, uh, in minute detail, of course, we would have a, a better world, undoubtedly. Uh, Ashoka is said to have converted to Buddhism. Actually, the word converted is probably wrong. Uh, we don't have any such pronouncement. We just know that he adopted what he calls dharma or dhamma in Prakrit. Uh, after a slaughter, according to his own pronouncement, after a slaughter of one lakh people in the Kalinga War, uh, which uh, and the bloodshed uh, actually uh, moved his heart, and he decided that uh, he should promote to atone for this. He should promote dharma, and which is basically the Buddhist dharma, the Buddhist uh, religion. The word religion naturally does not exist as such in the ancient text. And then he um, 
inscribed all over India, you see here the case of Girnar in Gujarat, he inscribed those <coughs> edicts where he not only tells something of his own story and his own uh, change of heart and his own uh, desires in life, but he also tells what he expects from his uh, subjects. So in summary, I've just taken a few values which, uh, again, this is at least a historical figure. You cannot deny his historicity. And um, uh, we don't know naturally to what extent he practiced what he preached. But there is good reason to believe that he at least tried to. So he first of all wished happiness to all. All men are my children, he begins in one of the edicts. And uh, this is akin to the value we, we saw in the Upanishads uh, previously. So, you know, we say Buddhism, we say Hinduism, we say Jainism, but the, the, again, I think I mentioned it earlier, the border lines are very blurred in ancient India. Ahimsa undoubtedly and vegetarianism, though he admits himself that his, in his kitchens uh, a couple of peacocks are still killed every day and once in a while a deer, but he says that too I am hoping to phase out. So uh, this is, uh, but please note that he, while he says what he is following and what he is advising, very interestingly there is no concept of imposing any of these. So though he follows Buddhism and promotes it, he also promotes the other faiths. And uh, there is no concept of a state religion in ancient India. That's extremely important because uh, the state religion did exist in, in the West uh, very much so. Compassion, a great value which I think has pretty much gone out of Indian society, I mean at least, uh, um, well, uh, in the majority of, of uh, uh, what we can see. Uh, medical treatment for humans and animals uh, are prescribed, including wild animals in what we today sanctuaries which are created uh, by Ashoka and this is confirmed in the Arthashastra of Kautilya. You know, he says every city on the north side of it there should be a, a forest where wild animals can be safe from hunting and poaching. Wells dug and trees planted along the roads for the benefit of humans and animals. Fair treatment of prisoners that is part of the uh, compassion that he uh, advises. Uh, including release of aged um, uh, prisoners, even though they may have committed crimes, or those who were instigated, who, you know, might not have committed a crime otherwise, and taking care of the families of prisoners. So, I mean, these are, even by modern standards, these are very advanced concepts. To him, the only glory of the ruler lies not in military conquests, but in having my subjects respect and practice dharma. dharma. <clears throat> Finally, and very interestingly, he is concerned with religious harmony. Of course, Ashoka had only to deal with, again, what we call today Buddhism, Jainism, and Hinduism, but there were many, many sub-sects in each of them. Plus, there were other sects which have disappeared, like the Ajivikas, like the, the Charvakas, the so-called atheistic sects of ancient India. <clears throat> so there must have been, you know, rivalries, doctrinal disputes and so on. And he says, he, the recipe is, he gives is very simple. He says, first of all, do not show excessive devotion for your religion. In other words, don't be a fanatic. And he says specifically, don't praise your own religion too much. You know, be discreet about what you practice yourself. And um, don't condemn other religions, though he adds in, his, in the full text of the edicts, he adds, if you have to condemn, then do it with, you know, my language. If you want to criticize, in other words, another doctrine, use a my language. Do not be offensive towards other religions. And all should be well learned in the good doctrines of other religions. In other words, he wants everyone to study the other religions. So, of course, these are very good uh, um, uh, guidelines for what today we would call uh, interfaith dialogues and uh, of course it's all based on mutual respect ultimately. Arthashastra gives a few more, I mean there's a lot in Arthashastra about the duties of a king and uh, please note it is not the rights of a king, you know, in the, again in European um, uh, the Middle Ages, you know, the, the, you have the concept of a uh, 
uh, absolute uh, monarch abs with absolute power, including power of life and death over his subjects. That never existed in India. There is no, in fact, the king is loaded with duties. And <coughs> uh, Cordelia says, in the happiness of his subjects lies his happiness. So this is the fundamental philosophy of uh, governance, you, that you have to ensure the happiness of your subjects. In their welfare, his welfare. Whatever pleases himself, he shall not consider as good. But whatever pleases his subjects, he shall consider as good. So this is the, again, the fundamental philosophy, which would have been practiced to varying degrees, of course, never as ideally as we might wish. But this was the ideal put in front of the rulers. And then the very important notion, which we will find towards the end, confirmed by uh, uh, a historical figure, uh, that uh, there was in Cautilia's time, by Cautilia's time, warfare was very widespread. And a big chunk of Arthashastra is about warfare, how to win wars, you know, especially by undermining the adversary uh, uh, through spies, through uh, spreading false rumors. I mean, there are lots of uh, uh, tactics which have been regarded as very cynical, but uh, which might be very effective. But then <clears throat> the whole idea is that though warfare might be and was actually very widespread, uh, it was not supposed to affect the common population. In other words, the common people were not supposed to be plundered, abused, uh, uh, looted, victimized, uh, and of course not slaughtered which is a very Indian concept. If you look at the way the, uh, you know, again, Western conquerors take Alexander the Great, take the Persian kings, Darius the Great, for example, also, uh, there is no mercy for the conquered populations. Of course, the, uh, later on, the uh, Hunas or Huns, um, uh, there is, uh, I mean, plunder is very legitimate. If you look at the Greek chroniclers of Alexander the Great, it was, uh, uh, a perfectly normal reward for the conquering armies. This was frowned upon in India, though it was sometimes done, but this was not regarded as dharmic. Having acquired a new territory, in fact, the king should get accepted. So how does he get accepted by the conquered <laughs> population? He should adopt the same mode of life, the same dress, language, and customs as, as those of the people. He should follow the people in their faith, we, with which they celebrate their national, religious, or congressional festivals or amusements. He should always hold religious life in high esteem, but please note, truly so, only for the sake of being accepted. This is what Cautilia means. So he should, you know, pretend to worship the gods of the uh, uh, population and so on, so that he will gain easy acceptance. He should release all the prisoners and afford help to miserable, helpless, and diseased persons. So <clears throat> these are some of the thoughts uh, that Cotillia gives. There are so many other texts, but I want to briefly mention, uh, in uh, uh, Tamil literature, there is the famous uh, Kural by Thiruvalluva, dated approximately 5th century of the Common Era, or AD. And these are couplets. And uh, there are three parts in the Kural. One is about ethics and governance, the other is about wealth, and the, other, the third is about love. We will see that this follows a certain division that we'll come upon later. So uh, there are many very beautiful aphorisms. Uh, I've just taken a couple of them. The wealth which never declines is not riches, but learning. So as I said in the talk about education, knowledge is regarded as something sacred and, uh, you know, above everything else. Always failure then is as good as success. So we have something which is almost akin to what the Gita says here. Failure is as good as success. The world gives up those who give up. Stick to your task. So the importance of effort and striving. The harm fools do to themselves is beyond anything their foes do to them. And this is, of course, uh, something we can see very often in day-to-day -day life. This one I love, in prosperity bend low. So be modest when you are, you know, when you have riches, when you have means, don't... Uh, today we speak of what is, what is the phrase? Ostentatious... Conspicuous consumption. 
conspicuous consumption, ostentatious living, and all that. So this is not the ancient philosophy. <coughs> Bend low in prosperity, but in adversity stand straight. This is very well put. <coughs> the great hide others' faults, only the small talk of nothing else. So you can see how, and there are many other such texts in India, how the, the values were imparted. And imparted also uh, in education because those texts were studied by young Indians. There are Subhasitas also. There are collections of uh, sayings, proverbs, mostly in Sanskrit, but also, I mean, all Indian languages have them also. So let's see just a few. The wise should learn to accept wisdom from anybody, even from a child. So that is humility, of course. Doesn't the small night lamp shine things which the sun cannot? Even the weak, when they are in good number, gain strength. A rope made of strands of grass can bind even an elephant. So that is in unity is strength. <clears throat> Trees are like good people. I think I read this one in the ecological traditions. While they themselves stand in the scorching sun, they provide shade and fruit for others. So selflessness. This is how all these values were you know, spread. One should not lament over the past. There is no use in dreaming of the future. The wise live for the present, hmm? the here and now, as we say today. What is the purpose of parrot-like learning devoid of practice? It may at best entertain people. So practice what you know. And there are many, many stories you know, in India. You would have read lots of them ridiculing for example, pundits, you know, who are very well learned, but when it comes to actual practice, uh, uh, their knowledge is nowhere. <coughs> Finally, one may own a hundred cows, but his need is only one cup of milk. One may own a hundred villages, but his need is only one morsel of food. One may own a hundred room palace, but his need is but one cot. All the rest belongs to others. So, in fact, you can really claim what you actually need. And so this is the opposite, exactly the opposite uh, philosophy of again what came to us uh, some years back, but not anymore today really very much. Uh, from, uh, you know, again, um, American business philosophy of greed is good. You, you know that phrase, I suppose. So you, it's always very interesting to compare the two approaches. Right, and, and it has been practiced by uh, all, all kinds of rulers. Of course, there was the case, uh, I will not read out all this, of Ashoka, um, <coughs> who wanted to create a universal uh, religion because basically he was mo moving away from Islam and he was condemned by orthodox Islamic scholars. And he said, or rather his biographer, Abu Fazl, said that uh, every sect can assert his doctrine without apprehension and everyone can worship God after his own fashion. So he had, in this sense, adopted the Indian uh, concept of, well, I don't like the word tolerance very much, but acceptance, rather, of the other. This is a summary, if you like, of the, the uh, ethical system. Uh, it integrates things we have seen so far, but also this uh, concept of the Purushartha. Purushartha are the four goals of life for a well-ordered living. So the first, of course, is Dharma. Without Dharma, there is nothing. Uh, the second is wealth. Please know, uh, you know, special sects of people, of us, people who chose the and, uh, to belong to spiritual seekers, they are not But actually, uh, Artha is always subject to Dharma because Artha without Dharma, we can easily understand what it means. Similarly, with Karma, which is regarded as perfectly legitimate, all the pleasures of life are legitimate in ancient India, provided again they are you know, controlled by Dharma. Finally, Moksha, well, that is for those who aspire to the ultimate liberation, which actually is not really liberation 
from the rebirth, cycle of rebirth, so much as it is from uh, ignorance. There are other systems of values, Satyam, Sivam, Sundaram, uh, which are good to remember. Respect of women, parents, elders, guru, you know those uh, mantras uh, about in the Upanishads, uh, asking us to regard the mother, the parents, the, the elders, and finally the acharya, as, uh, and even also the guest, as uh, uh, even God. Respect of the other, collaboration over competition. Competition exists, of course, but you find, especially in uh, institutions like the institutions of guild, the Shri in ancient India, unfortunately I won't have time to dilate upon it, you find that actually what is promoted is collaboration, cooperation among the people. And, uh, but it's actually, uh, uh, it is not to be the main uh, guideline in the world of economy. Modesty and self-effacement is important in, among the ancient Indian values. And finally, let us not forget trupti, contentment. It is not exactly happiness, but it is part of it. So, these are some of the values. Now, let us turn towards historical manifestation and uh, of these value systems. Otherwise, it all re remains a little bit theoretical. So, I have selected just a few. There are many more uh, testimonies from travelers to India. This one is a Greek historian who talks about Indians and says that there are usages among them which contribute to prevent the occurrence of famine. For whereas among other nations it is usual in the contests of war to ravage the soil, this is exactly what Cotillia was telling us about the duties of the conqueror, to, and thus to reduce it to an uncultivated waste among the Indians on the contrary, by whom husbandmen, that is to say, uh, uh, peasants, farmers, are regarded as a class that is sacred and inviolable, the tillers of the soil, even when the battle is raging in their neighborhood, are undisturbed by any sense of danger. For the combatants on either side in waging the conflict make carnage of each other, but allow those engaged in husbandry to remain quite unmolested. So it's interesting that we have a confirmation of Cotillia here. This is a, from a 11th century astronomer who lived in what is today Spain. Uh, the Indians, he says, among all nations, through the centuries and since antiquity, wisdom, justice, and moderation. People endowed with virtues of self-control, creators of sublime thoughts, universal fables, rare inventions, and remarkable conven conceptions. Another, and these are interestingly two Muslim scholars, of the 11th century. Uh, this Al Idrisi, who lived in Sicilia, says Indians are naturally inclined to justice, this word justice comes again, and never depart from it in their actions. Their good faith, honesty, and fidelity to their engagements are well known, and they are so famous for these qualities that people flock to their country from every side. Uh, then we jumped, there, there are many others I could have taken in between, but we jumped to the British because, you know, the British um, uh, colonial masters, you find the, the two extremes. You find people who completely demonize uh, uh, Indian society, Indian uh, customs as being extremely barbaric, regressive, and so on, uh, and therefore justifying the duty of the white man's burden in civilizing India. So that is one category. At another, you find people, even though they were governors like here, who cannot help testifying that in this case, this is John Malcolm, the Hindu, uh, Hindu inhabitants are a race of men, generally speaking, not more distinguished by their lofty stature than they are for some of the finest qualities of the mind. They are brave, generous, and humane, and their truth is as remarkable as their This is another praise from John Malcolm. Elphinstone, who is well known, better known in fact, as both a historian but also a governor of the Bombay presidency, he says, no set of people among the Hindus are so depraved as the dregs of our great towns. The villagers are everywhere amiable, affectionate to their families, kind to their neighbors. 
The Hindus are mild and gentle people. Their superiority in purity of manners is not flattering to our self-esteem. So that again is high praise in the, you know, in the mouth of a British official. And Max Miller, who summarized, in fact, some of the earlier uh, praise by uh, travelers in a talk entitled, um, <coughs> uh, it is entitled, uh, What Can India Teach Us, I think, um, where he was concerned by this demonization that was taking place by British rulers, and he wanted to balance it. Uh, so he, he gave a famous lecture in Oxford, and he, in this lecture, he quotes some of the previous testimonies, and he says at the end, it is surely extremely strange that whenever, either in Greek or in Chinese or in Persian or in Arab writings, we meet with any attempts at describing the distinguishing features in the national character of the Indians, regard for truth and justice should always be mentioned first. So, well, it's for you to decide whether things have changed for the better or the worse. I will not go into that, but we might uh, th reflect upon this. Um, I want to, uh, then, before I conclude, I want to just review a few shining examples to me in the modern era of people who have embodied this value system we have seen. Uh, so that, you know, we don't uh, lose hope that um, uh, well, there is no ethics anymore in India. It's not quite the case. Um, J.C. Bose, of course, was a well-known figure of the what has been called the Bengal Renaissance. He was a physicist, biologist, botanist, uh, incidentally father, regarded as the father of Bengali science fiction. But um, uh, he's well-known for, apart from his work on uh, plants and the sensitiveness of plants, uh, well, the IEEE uh, has uh, acknowledged that he was actually the first discoverer of wireless transmission before Marconi. Let me not go into that. Um, and, but then, you see, he had a certain uh, value system. And this value system prevented him from registering patents, which he could have done uh, before Marconi. In, uh, in fact, he, he demonstrated uh, wireless transmission in London in uh, 18... 95, if I remember correctly, and he could have taken a patent on it immediately. But Marconi did it a couple of years later. <coughs> Finally, one American friend convinced him to take a US patent for something different. Um, uh, in in uh, uh, 1904, but uh, he, it was against his own, and he uh, allowed it to lapse. And when he was asked later on by a journalist, you know, why did you not? patent all these discoveries, he said, you know, I do not consider that this knowledge belongs to me. So this is again something where you can see that the, the value systems are very different. Because today, of course, we speak of uh, intellectual property rights, but then in the ancient uh, Indian view, you cannot claim ownership on knowledge. You can only add to it, but you cannot say this, this concept belongs to me. So, well, of course, there is a contradiction, and that is what we can note. <coughs> uh, Prafula Chandra Roy, another great Bengali, uh, known as Acharya Prafula Chandra Roy, was, of course, a very eminent chemist uh, who taught chemistry in the Presidency College for a long time, and then uh, at the University of Calcutta. Uh, but then he was also a, a, a kind of an ascetic. He lived for a long time in this university with, in a small room which had just the bare essentials. And uh, most of his salary went into helping needy uh, students. In those days, please remember, this is uh, the, the, at the height of the freedom movement. And uh, poor students had no help uh, for their studies. So he helped them and he also helped to develop the uh, uh, indigenous uh, chemical industry in Bengal especially. Uh, he is the creator of the Bengal Chemical and Pharmaceutical Works. And he would you know, invest some of his money into starting those industries, contribute uh, through his knowledge and his, uh, 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 I mean his direct involvement. Uh, but then once the industry was well on its feet, he would withdraw from it and start another. He's, that was the philosophy of Swadeshi, you know, that India must uh, economically and therefore industrially also stand on her own feet. 
Uh, but then he said also, you know, that uh, he was uh, active participant in the nationalist movement, and he said once that there are occasions that demanded that I should leave the test tube to attend the call of the country. Science can wait, Swaraj cannot. So uh, these are, of course, people who are great embodiments. Uh, there could be many others to be cited. Let me just mention Tilak, uh, because uh, for a special reason. Of course, he is the author of this slogan, rather this motto, Swaraj is my birthright and I shall have it, and he suffered from it, for it. But in uh, one of the trials, there were several trials which finally sent him to Mandalay, as you know, uh, on uh, imprisonment in Mandalay for many years. But he admitted in when he was confronted by the fact that some of his writings seemed to, you know, incite uh, uh, people to rebel violently against the British. He said that uh, he endorsed Sri Krishna's teaching that killing is legitimate if done without selfish motive and for the good of the society. So this is, well, one interpretation of the teaching of the Gita. But he also said, and this is very Indian in many ways, he also said, let us then try our utmost and leave the generations to come to enjoy that fruit. Remember, it is not you who had planted the mango trees, the fruit whereof you have tasted. Let the advantage now go to our children and their descendants. It is only given to us to toil and work. This is exactly what the Gita says. You know, uh, uh, this is the concept of Nishkama Karma. And so, there ought to be no relaxation in our efforts, lest we incur the curse of those that come after us. So this whole philosophy is that you do not work for yourself, but for the benefit <coughs> of the society uh, and even humanity at large. There are many uh, ordinary Indians, I would have liked to have a little more time on this, but I will just uh, quickly mention uh, how, you know, I've been collecting those examples. And um, this is about, for example, uh, uh, someone who started, uh, who was a Tamilian, who came to Dharavi, the large uh, slum in Mumbai, and who started with a salary of 12 rupees a month, just carrying vegetables around, but who, by sheer exertion of, you know, a patient effort uh, ended up as a, as a millionaire and uh, but still lives in this slum though I mean he could afford a great mansion somewhere in Mumbai because he says that his whole life is there and he owes his wealth to the slum so he wants to improve things there and you know he keeps living there so he's been highlighted in the media for that reason and you know this is this idea that Artha must benefit the society this is about a beggar. I collected this because I found it uh, very moving to see a beggar in uh, Gujarat, in Mehsana, giving his entire uh, 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 savings of 3,000 rupees in this case uh, to a school for speech impaired and uh, hearing impaired girls. And he says, I just need two meals a day and some money to send back to, send back to my ailing wife in Rajkot. Apart from this, Whatever I earn, I use to buy food for poor, hungry people. But he's a beggar himself. So you can see that the, here the ethical values are at work. I'm going to skip this one because I want to mention this exceptional case uh, we, which takes us even beyond the concept of ethics. Uh, this is, I, I wish, you know, all these uh, uh, cases, and uh, I have collected many of them, were integrated in our textbooks at school level because they would be very inspiring for the children. This is about Yogendra Singh Yadav and uh, yeah. who has been nicknamed the hero of Tiger Hill Kargil War. So very briefly uh, this was about recovering the, Kar uh, the Tiger Hill which had been occupied by the Pakistanis and they were of course at a vantage point. So the uh, Indian soldiers were sitting ducks uh, nevertheless, one regiment was sent with him at the head and uh, to reconquer the hill and notice, note all the positions where the Pakistanis were actually located. So he, all of his companions were shot dead and he himself received 15 bullets but there was something in him which he says made a decision that he will not die before he has been able to go back to the base camp and pass on the information to his commanders uh, about the exact Pakistani positions. But he didn't know how to go because he could not move anymore. 
So, and his left arm was completely uh, uh, dead, in fact, and he could not stand. So then he had a vision of what he calls Devi Shakti. He says a being in white who said, son, roll down this Nalla. There was a gully, a small uh, channel uh, there, and uh, uh, he started, he just rolled about and pushed himself, and that way he reached finally uh, the base camp. And uh, before fainting, he was able, because he was losing a lot of blood, he was able to pass on the information to his commander. And then he was flown to uh, Delhi. He stayed for one and a half years in, uh, in, in the military hospital, and finally rejoined the army afterwards. And he says, when with full faith a man surrenders everything he has to accomplish a certain task, and this without reserve, ulterior motive or calculation, Certainly then an inner strength, a shakti, arises in him. I don't know whether he has ever read the Bhagavad Gita. I have, I have no idea. Uh, but this is exactly you know, the, the highest philosophy you can find in the Gita. Now finally, and I'll just take a couple of minutes. You know, the no, these notions uh, of ethics have been practiced even in the world of business uh, in India. Uh, in fact, there are people who have uh, studied and made theses about tra the traditional way of conducting business in India. So not the modern uh, corporate uh, uh, ethos of business, but the traditional. Because we do have many traditional business practices as well as business houses in India. Now, one shining example, of course, is this, the Dhabawalas of uh, uh, Mumbai, which have become famous uh, simply because Harvard School of Business came and studied them. Before Harvard School of Business came, nobody was taking particular interest in the Dapawalas. But what Harvard School of Business found, and which they found very interesting and unexpected, was that this was basically a trust-based manner of conducting business, where people entrust these tiffin carriers, sometimes containing not just food, but money, or some important papers, or a passport, and the whole system runs so economically with almost zero error level. Though several lakhs of tiffins are carried and delivered every day, uh, the system is run so efficiently with uh, you know, mass transport systems, cycles, as you can see here, and on foot. So this was something that the American uh, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, researchers had a very great difficulty. So this is actually um, a, a typically uh, uh, ethical system that runs on the old system. But in addition, we have had big corporate houses. I'm just listing a few without going into details because they're familiar to you. Uh, of course, the Tatas have uh, promoted the idea of welfare of the worker, in particular. Jamshedpur, in particular, innovated by uh, you know, saying that the worker was taking full charge of the minute, the second he stepped out of his home in the morning till he came back. And uh, it was a shining example, uh, which then other uh, business houses were forced to emulate to some degree. So this was, uh, we have in the south the famous Murugapa group, which I forget whether it is 20,000 or 30,000 crore group. Uh, where, uh, again, a lot of ethical values have been practiced and uh, uh, schools, especially for the workers, uh, access to health care has been very, very heavily subsidized. So you, you can call this philanthropy. In fact, there was recently, last year or two years ago, one American, but I cannot for, uh, remember who, who said that the concept of philanthropy does not exist in India. You know that uh, Indians do not practice philanthropy uh, in the way Bill Gates, for example, practices philanthropy. Now, they, what they did not realize is that there are two totally di distinct concepts of philanthropy. One which advertises itself and is in the news every second day. And we know exactly the amounts that Bill Gates you know, has donated to this or that cause. And the other which is done very silently <coughs> and unassumingly, like you have this Infosys Foundation here, which has benefited lots of schools and libraries, and also rural development in Karnataka. Uh, this is about uh, uh, giant irrigation system in Maharashtra, which has uh, uh, ensured the prosperity of the entire Jalgaon district by providing subsidized 
um, uh, irrig drip irrigation systems and buying the entire produce from the farmers and then processing it, uh, etc. So, and this is in fact, uh, well, I can hardly speak of a business here because this is the founder of the Arvind Eye Hospital, uh, which ended up practicing lakhs of operations every day and many of which for the poor patients are done free of cost. So, uh, you know, philanthropy, uh, it all depends what you put in, in, the, in the world. Finally, and I'll end with this, the, another case documented to us uh, by the Harvard School of Business, the uh, behavior of the Taj Mahal Hotel uh, under the uh, terrorist attack of 2611. And what, the, what brought the Harvard School of Business here was that they went well beyond their call of duty to save the lives of the guests, when actually they could have easily escaped from the hotel because they knew all the back door uh, exits and they could have run away, but they stayed on and tried to guide the guests to as much safety as they could and they saved a number of lives in the process, but often at the cost of their own lives. So. <coughs> So, in fact, this is what the report of the Harvard School of Business notes, that uh, this, this, different, this unexpected behavior, which was not selfish, I mean extremely selfless, uh, is r to be traced to the Indian culture concept of guest is God, you know, atiti devo bhava. There is a much more paternalistic equation between employer and employee that creates a kinship the Taj employees felt a sense of loyalty to the hotel as well as a sense of responsibility to the guests. So here you see how <coughs> a, a whole cultural background, ethical system ends up uh, making a difference between life and death for some people. So examples could be multiplied and this is just to remind us that this ethical value system is not quite dead yet. How will it in the clash with modernity is yes, and uh, we do have a crisis of ethics no doubt and there is a fast uh, rise in criminality in India in particular but then as always I think it's very fruitful to look back and see you know that uh, many of these values uh, could uh, help the situation and uh, perhaps save India from uh, the worst outcomes of this present crisis. So thank you very much.